Uh, so well, welcome back everyone. We, our next speaker of the day is Adam Pigott from University of Queensland and we'll be talking about the automorphism groups of the easiest non-abelian non -abelian infinite groups still that still present many mysteries. Thank, thanks, Mark. So go on, Adam. I've got to unmute myself. Oh, I already did, did that. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, I was unmuted and then muted. Well, thanks, Michael. Thanks for the invitation to give a talk. I understand this was going to be an in-person talk, but stuff happens. And thanks everyone for zooming in. Um, yeah, so the groups I want to talk about are the automorphism groups of the easiest non-abelian infinite groups. And I had to think about this, whether or not this would be a controversial statement about what the easiest non-abelian infinite groups would be. Um, I was originally going to say the easiest infinite groups, but then I decided that infinite abelian groups are probably easier. But the, the sort of groups I have in mind are free groups and universal coxeter groups. So what do I mean by that? Just free products of involutions. Um, can anyone think of any families of infinite non-abelian groups that are easier to understand than these? I, um, all right, so if, we're, if we want to, if, if for example, you're interested in automorphism groups of groups, and then you, um, you say, well, where should I start? Then these are pretty natural places to start. And um, of course, my claim is that even though they are the easy infinite non-abelian groups, their automorphism groups are not easy and they have things left for us to figure out. So for example, the, the families of the automorphism group of the free group of rank N and the outer automorphism group, they're objects of classical study in group theory. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, people have been thinking about them for at least a century. Um, and um, there's still lots to think about. They exhibit rich and complex features and their study is valued for its deep connections to geometry and topology. So um, I think people who have worked in geometric group theory, certainly, but uh, group theory more generally will be aware of sort of results about the automorphisms of free groups, which are, are very important and constructions like the construction of outer space for free groups. So these are, um, th these are sort of, you can make a name for yourself studying those things, but then we've got these other families, the automorphism group of a universal coxeter group and the outer automorphism group of a universal coxeter group. They're much less complicated. There's no doubt about that. Um, but they still present mysteries worth exploring. So my experience thinking about these groups is the moment I, I tell people about these groups that I, I might I'll be thinking about them and that there's a, people are not impressed that the groups you're thinking about must be so easy, but it turns out that there's um, things we don't know and um, and the problems are interesting and partly because they're of the relationships to other groups. So that's in this talk, my goal is just to um, highlight some of the work that's already been done in these families and some of the questions that remain for you to answer if you'd like to get into it. All right, so some structural results, which are really just, um, because we, I need to mention some of the vocabulary in the talk. So, if we want to think about um, groups like a group like WN and then the automorphism groups of WN. So this is just N copies of, of a group of groups of order two. So, um, and in this presentation, we've got the A1 through A and they're the generators. So of course, if you want to think about this group, you just think about string, each element is just a string of AIs. Uh, but you never see, uh, you can reduce a word just by if you see A3 followed by A3, then you can delete them. So it's pretty, um, 
as far as understanding how to solve the word problem and, and what to do, they're really simple. You can, the, the, the Cayley graph with respect to a generating set is incredibly pleasant, it's a tree. Um, so what about their automorphisms? Well, there's, there are the automorphisms that come from just permuting the set of generators. If you swap all your A1s for A2s and A2s for A1s, then, then that would be, um, that's an automorphism. They generate a finite subgroup, of course, it's a symmetric group, uh, subgroup of automorphisms. So we've got those sorts of automorphisms. And then we have these um, more interesting automorphisms here, which are called partial conjugations. So the idea is that you pick one generator that is the acting generator, in this case, it's AI, and you conjugate one generator, that's AJ, it's called the domain, conjugate AJ by AI, and leave all of the other generators alone. And it turns out that this is um, an automorphism. Uh, some of you may know a bit more about the automorphisms of say right angle coxeter groups and so on, and you'd recognize partial conjugations there, but in the context of those groups, you don't have to think any more about, you don't have to think more complicated thoughts about uh, rules for what partial conjugations can be it's simply you pick one letter AI that acts on another one by conjugation and you leave all the other generators alone. So they're called partial conjugations and it turns out the partial conjugations generate a normal subgroup of the automorphism group. So we'll call that normal subgroup sigma of uh, or sigma or or you can it's the pure symmetric automorphisms. And that language might ring a bell for those who've thought about pure symmetric automorphisms of free groups or who've thought about pure braids. So that word pure is coming from uh, the same sort of place there. So partial conjugations turn out to be really important because they're a pretty simple thing. You imagine that um, if you if you know inner automorphisms where you conjugate every group element by a chosen group element, um, this is not one of those. But you would build a partial conjugation by say AI by doing um, uh, alpha say alpha one two alpha one three up to alpha one n would give you the inner automorphism by one conjugating everything by one. Okay, so what's why did I highlight the pure symmetric automorphisms? And well, it's because there's a, a couple of key structural results about the group of automorphisms of WN. These are, this one's very well known. Maybe people have known about this one for um, 80 years, 100 years, maybe. Um, I'd have to, have to remind myself of where the first reference is, but, um, you can, there's a semi-direct product decomposition of the automorphism group of a universal coxeter group into the pure symmetric automorphisms, it, that's the normal factor, and then the symmetric automorphisms, and that's all you need to understand. That's it, that's the entire group. Um, we can tease out a bit more detail. You can break up the pure symmetric automorphisms into a semi-direct product decomposition where this factor here is the, that's the inner automorphisms, but because WN has no center, that's isomorphic to the group itself. So you can understand the structure of the automorphism group in this way. So you can break down your study of the group into either I want to think about the pure symmetric automorphisms and, a, and I'm thinking about a finer index subgroup then, or even if you're thinking about um, sort of breaking up the pure symmetric automorphisms into the inner automorphisms and something else, you can do that as well. Um, all right. So why are these groups, why do I claim these groups are worth your time and why, why do I spend time thinking about them? Um, well, it's because of the connections with other interesting families of groups. That's really what makes the automorphism group of the universal coxal group interesting. Uh, so these connections inspire questions and they supply tools. And here are some of the connections uh, that I want to tell you about. Um, the first one is something which uh, is sort of folklore 
uh, and when when I when people when I've talked to people and it's come up, they've told me, "Oh yeah, I knew that." But then again, you don't see it written down often, and it's the uh, the a connection that the automorphism group of a free group of rank two is isomorphic to the automorphism group of the universal coxeter group of rank three, uh, which is also and also isomorphic to the automorphism group of the braid group of rank four. So if you are someone who finds the automorphism groups of free groups interesting, then this might be a reason to take an interest in the automorphism groups of universal coxeter groups. Or if you find the automorphism group of a braid group, you find that interesting or you find braid groups interesting, then there's another reason. You sort of can see the automorphism groups of universal coxeter groups as starting from the same place. And of course, as these indices go up, this connection um, changes. It's not an isomorphism anymore, but um, it's sort of, it's a valuable place to start. Um, maybe I'll give away the secret of how do you make this connection. Well, if you let um, E n be the subgroup of even length elements, in W n, then E n is isomorphic to the free group of rank n minus one. So what, what do I mean by the subgroup of even length elements? You can think of the subgroup generated by A1, A n, A2, A n, all the way up to A n minus one, A n. If you think of that subgroup of W n, um, all the words, all the elements you can generate have even length in the natural sense of length uh, that you get, look at the reduced words in WN, you can only get even length words. And this subgroup EN is um, characteristic. Every automorphism of the group preserves that subgroup. So you get a natural map then from, um, from the, you get this natural map from the automorphism group of WN to the automorphism group of FN minus one. Turns out that map is always injective. So we've got a, a, a map that goes into the automorphism group of a free group. And then in the special case when n is three, turns out the map is also um, surjective. So we get this isomorphism. Um, all right, so that's that's one reason why you might, that's one connection to to groups that 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 might get you thinking that the automorphism groups of universal coxal groups are pretty interesting. At least they've got this connection with the automorphism group of F2. Um, another connection is that the pure symmetric automorphisms of the free groups, they're, that they have um, a very similar presentation to the pure symmetric automorphism groups of the universal coxal groups. In fact, the difference is simply that you declare the generators for, for the universal group, the, for the, the generators of uh, this group, you just declare them to be involutions while they're infinite order over here. But otherwise, there, there are presentations for these groups where, where the only difference is you declare the generators to be involutions. So if you, if you find the pure symmetric automorphisms of a free group interesting, then um, you might find the pure symmetric automorphisms of a universal cox of the group interesting because you've got a group which is which may be easier to look at in some ways but um but if your arguments are combinatorial using relations and so on the same sort of arguments might be able to work here's another connection to a subgroup of the automorphism group of a free group there's a a subgroup of the automorphism group of the free group called the palindromic automorphisms so what makes an automorphism of a free group palindromic is that it sends every generator to a palindrome. For example, if you have X and Y get sent to uh, Y and X, Y, X, uh, I don't think, well, that wouldn't work because that's not an automorphism, but maybe I'll try X, Y, X, Y. Now I'd have a, an automorphism of the free group. Every generator is being sent to um, a palindrome, so that's a palindromic automorphism. 
And it turns out if you take the stabilizer of AN in the automorphism group of WN and use this relationship here, then your injective map maps onto the palindromic automorphism. So if you want to think about the palindromic automorphisms of a free group, you can do so by thinking about the stabilizer of one element in the automorphism group of a universal coxeter group. I should have put an attribution to that. That's a really neat observation by Andy Miller. Um, I like to mention that because the observation was recorded in a paper by uh, some other folks who mentioned Andy Miller, but you won't find it in any of Andy Miller's papers. Um, maybe the another compelling reason to find the automorphism group of WN to be interesting is that WN is an easy example of a right angle coxeter group. So we heard in the first talk today, we heard about coxeter groups and even we had a question about right angle coxeter groups. Um, so if you find right angle coxeter groups interesting, you, would, you might find their automorphism groups interesting and um, WN is just the easiest one of those, uh, the easiest right angle coxeter group. And of course, we also have um, FN is the is an easy right angle Artin group. So most of the results, are, or many of the results I'm going to mention today, are actually proved for or uh, more groups than the than the automorphism groups of universal coxeter groups. But I decided when I was planning this talk just to talk about universal coxeter groups because um, the idea was to show you even when you don't have complications like um, putting in commuting relations between involutions in your right angle cox group, even in the sort of somewhat in something of the simplest case, the automorphism group has mysteries for us. All right. Um, it is a strange feeling to be giving a talk and to encounter silence. Does anyone find any of these? I'd be delighted to hear some input. Do you find any of these um, connections with other groups interesting? Yes, I wasn't aware of this before. Um, so, or put another way, have you heard of the palindromic automorphisms of a free group? I've never heard of those here and I think it's interesting. Yeah, so um, Collins, uh, define the palindromic automorphisms and he's and then prove some results about them in the 80s so I guess that is that I can't remember what what this person's first name was but he was at Imperial College um, I think um, but the <clears throat> the stated um, sort of reason for defining the palindromic automorphisms was that their presentation was very similar to the symmetric automorphisms of a free group. So um, these groups are all dancing around uh, an analogy to braid groups and pure braid groups that sort of inspired people and to sort of subgroups of mapping class groups as well. So, all right. So maybe, um, maybe some of these reasons have convinced you that the automorphism groups of universal coxal groups are not uh, are, are worth having a look at. So now let's think about some questions that you would naturally have. Um, like, for example, can can I find spaces with geometric properties that allow me to learn algebraic facts about the group? So a natural one in the geometric group theory crowd is to say, are these groups cat zero? So do they act uh, faithfully or, and geometrically on a, on a cat zero space. So Gersten proved that the automorphism group of Fn is not a cat zero group when n is greater than or equal to three. Um, and he did this by exhibiting a poison subgroup that lives in ord Fn. So he found a, sub, a subgroup that behaves in a way that subgroups in cat zero groups cannot behave. Um, so if you wanted to know whether or not the automorphism group of WN could possibly be cat zero, you immediately look at the image of this embedding and say, is Gersten's poison subgroup in there? And the answer is that it's not. 
Um, so, okay, we'll have to work a little harder. Can I construct a subgroup like Gersten's poison subgroup? Um, well, the answer to that is I have not been able to construct one. Um, if you could, that'd be great. So we're left with the question, is the automorphism group of WN a cat zero group? Um, so here's some results to sort of pique your interest. In 2010, um, Kim Rowane and Genevieve Walsh and I um, showed that the automorphism group of F2 is bi-automatic and it's a cat zero group. So that's not dealing with, so that, that, would, that tells us something about what W3, but um, and part of why I was look we were looking at that question was because we're thinking about the automorphism groups of universal crop sort of groups and the story goes like this we're we're built using this connection so there's the this slide which I've made a mess of with all my annotations is where I say the connections inspire questions and supply tools. So we wanted to know about the automorphism groups of universal coxeter groups, but we saw this connection here and, and this one here, and we knew we couldn't use the map for high of A's of N, that we couldn't use the argument that showed that the automorphism group of Fn minus one is not cat zero, it wasn't gonna help us for low numbers or wasn't going to help us at all. But that first connection about the isomorphism uh, led us to, in particular, the, the connection between ORT W3 and the automorphism group of the Bray group of rank four, led us to follow, um, follow a few strings. And I guess I should put some parentheses there to, in case that's not obvious. Um, the idea of proof here is that the automorphism group of Bray group of rank four is actually um, the inner automorphisms, semi-direct product, and involution. So the inner automorphisms of, uh, or the, the outer automorphism group of B4 has order two. And um, from this result, and, and um, Brady um, had showed that, this is Tom Brady here, um, showed that the inner automorphisms of the braid group or braid group modulite center acts faithfully and geometrically on a cat zero two complex. So we had here, we had that the automorphism group of W3 or the free group of rank two, if you like, is automorph is isomorphic to the automorphism group of B4 and the inner automorphism group of B4 is a cat zero group. So how do we know that, um, the existence of this um, of this extra involution doesn't mess things up. Well, we went along and found, we went and had a look at Brady's action and we found the extra isometry we needed was already there in that space. So, um, so that's an example of how these connections um, can, can lead us to new results. In this case, it happened to be a new result for the automorphism group of F2. Um, and because the action, because the space is a systolic complex of a certain type, we get that the group is bioautomatic. But um, that was um, sort of one way in which thinking about these groups can lead to sort of um, putting together results using tools from other groups and so on, but using those connections. Uh, does anyone have any questions about, about that particular I'll just give you a moment to ask a question about what I've got there. Uh, you just said that bioautomaticity is related to systolicity. Can you elaborate on that? Okay, that came from, let's see. It's a cyst, the, the space is a systolic simplicial complex. And I'm just, the, the, the paper, it, it's of a type described by Yanuskevich and Sviakovsky in, in a paper called Simplicial Non-Positive Curvature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's um, a size condition on the links, right? That's right, yeah. And so it just ha so happens that Brady's space is, has all the right properties. Um, okay. So we got that. All right. So that still leaves open is the automorphism group of WN, a cat zero group for N greater than or equal to four. 
is the outer automorphism group uh, cat zero group for n greater than or equal to four. So these are questions still lurking. So we, we can't use, it's not obvious how to use the poison subgroup, um, Gersten's poison subgroup. It's not obvious how to find one if there is one in there. Um, and um, so answering requires finding a poison subgroup or exhibiting a property of the group incompatible with being a cat zero group. So these would be ways of showing that the first two would be ways of showing that these, these groups are not cat zero groups or showing that a candidate construction is a cat zero group. In other words, maybe the answer is that they are cat zero groups, which would be, which would give us a lot of, um, in some ways, the positive answer is, is wonderful because it um, gives you machinery you can use and you instantly you know a lot of stuff. So what could a candidate construction be? Right. Um, here's a candidate construction inspired by, or at least by analogy with, color and voteman's outer space for the outer automorphism and groups of FN. Uh, Daryl McCullough and Andy Miller built a simplicial complex associated to the automorphism group of a free product of groups. So this is in one of those memoirs of the AMS monographs and um, their space. So it, you get different spaces for different free products of groups, um, but I'll, I'll call KN is my notation for the particular space that arises um, when you think about the outer automorphism group of WN. This is constructed by gluing together pieces, each piece a copy of the geometric realization of the hypertree poset. So I'll tell you what hypertrees are because I'm not sure everyone saw those or what the hypertree poset is. And, and then, but just from this slide, give you the idea that whatever their hypertree poset is, we're going to take copies of, of that of the geometric realization and we're going to glue them together. And the gluing instructions use a relationship between commuting products of partial conjugations and hypertrees. So um, it's a bit strange, but I already had these slides done in a different presentation and um, I had some technical trouble earlier this morning. Um, so I didn't have a chance to put them in. So I've just switched to a, a different presentation with a different color scheme. I'm sorry for that. But these are the hypertrees of rank four. So what's a hypertree? Um, well, a hypergraph is um, a variation on a graph where ed edges uh, include more than two vertices. Um, so for example, in this hypertree here, we see that there's a, that one and four make an edge, but two, three, and four also make an edge. And a hypertree, is a connected hypergraph with the property that um, when two edges intersect, they do so in a single vertex. Right? So it's basically, it gives you, there's, there's something called a, a hyper walk, um, hyper paths, and whatever you think of for a graph, just throw the word hyper in front of it. And there's a version of it for hypergraphs, uh, but hyper trees, um, we can see here, <laughs> They include ed edges with more than two vertices. So here's, an ed here's a hypertree with four vertices. Um, and they've been arranged on the page in a certain way to indicate a um, sort of, they have different, there's different types of trees here. Right? There's one, there's sort of isomorphism types up to changing the, the labels around. Right? But there's also an, uh, a partially ordered set structure here. Where does it come from? It comes from a thing called folding. So if two distinct hyper edges intersect non-trivially, then they can be replaced by the union to give a hyper true with one less hyper edge. In other words, you take two edges that intersect. Like for example, if we were to take this hyper tree here and we were to take these two edges, hyper edges and fold them, that's just putting them into the same hyper edge and we'd have this hyper tree. And of course, if we fold those two edges, we get this hyper tree. So um, there's a natural uh, partial order on this, on the set of hyper trees. And 
there's a unique minimal element, which is the hypertree in which there's only one hyper edge. And then we have the simplicial realization of the um, hypertrees of rank n, it's called the hypertree complex. Uh, so what's this got to do with, there's a picture of the hypertree, of the link of the unique um, minimal vertex in the hypertree complex of rank four. Um, so what's this got to do with automorphism groups of universal coxeter groups? Well, given a partial conjugation and here, there's a different notation here where D is a set. So for example, if I had one acting on two, oh, I used completely different notation, sorry. If I have alpha, the partial conjugation where I have one acting on two and one acting on three, I could combine those into what I've written here as X one acting on two, three. So it's just an, an idea that you can combine partial conjugations with the same acting letter into sort of a, a bigger thing. And um, there's an idea of what it means for a partial conjugation to be associated with a particular hypertree or we call it carried by. And the rule is if for all things in the domain and for all elements that are not in the domain, to get between the two, you have to, the, your simple walk has to visit um, the acting letter. Um, I don't want to get too bogged down in that, but I think what you should understand is that some combinations of partial conjugations are carried by this hypertree and some are not. And then we have, um, we say that a, an automorphism uh, is carried by, this is, this is just notation for one of those subgroups of the outer automorphism group of um, the universal Coxa group. That's carried by a hypertree if it can be written as a product of partial conjugations, each of which is carried by the hypertree. So, Hypertrees are some partial conjugations are related to hypertrees. Some commuting products of partial conjugation are related to hypertrees. And then we have, you, we use that relationship to dream up a, um, McCullough and Miller use that relationship to describe a gluing procedure, taking copies of the hypertree complex and gluing them together. All right, so it's, uh, it's a combinatorial object, or it's a simplicial object, but it's constructed combinatorially and it's got the, the group structure somehow buried in there. And uh, that was the Y hypertrees. So here's, the, here's a result um, that I proved while on sabbatical and visiting Murray and George at the University of Newcastle. And that was that the appropriate McCullough Miller space KN is the perfect is a perfect model for the outer automorphism groups of WN. What do I mean by perfect? The automorphism group of the simplicial complex that you construct is exactly the outer automorphism group of WN. So um, the outer automorphism group of WN not only maps into it in a natural way, but that and and that map is an embedding, but it's actually uh, Subjective as well. So um, remember, this was inspired by wondering if the automorphism group of WN is cat zero and wanting a candidate complex on which to try some things. And we discover that the McCullough Miller space is perfect in the sense that it doesn't have, um, it has all the symmetries I want and it doesn't have any, any extra ones. And it sort of fits into a, um, it means McCullough's Miller space in this in this sense fits into sort of um, a family or fits in with to a picture where we have certain types of groups and accurate geometric models. So um, algebraic groups, you've got spherical buildings, mapping class groups, you've got complexes of curves, the outer, outer automorphisms of a free group, you've got the spine of outer space. And then for the outer automorphisms of universal coxeter groups, we've got McCullough Miller space. Um, so, well, may, maybe I won't belabor this point, but the idea of proof 
require I had to show that that the um, the automorphism group of the simplicial realization of the hypertree poset is in fact just the symmetric group of order m, and then that the um, the gluing procedure means that pieces are, the way that pieces are glued together means that if you know where one piece goes and its orientation, then everything else is determined. Um, all right, so we've got this candidate space for the outer automorphisms of WM, a, a candidate simplicial complex. And the idea is, well, I wanted to know if the outer automorphisms of WN or the automorphisms of WN, I want to know if they're, they're cat zero. I've got a space on which they act. Can I give that space a cat zero metric? And Charles Cunningham proved, and the preprint just got uploaded a few months ago to um, the archive. This is from Charlie's thesis. Charlie was one of Kim Wayne's uh, PhD students that for n greater than or equal to four, McCullough Miller space cannot be given an equivariant cat zero metric. So I, I don't know whether I was disappointed by that result or, or, or delighted, but as usual, you just like to know the truth. So th there's the truth. The color middle space is not the candidate that's going to help us show that, um, that the, the autom outer automorphism groups of WN are cat zero. Or, um, so that doesn't mean that the outer automorphism outer automorphism group of WN is not cat zero. It just means that this space is not going to be the one that that shows it if it is. Um, so here's another sort of taking a different direction. So sort of moving away from McCullough Miller space, but still related to the question of are these groups cat zero? Can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah, go for it. So did he find a poison subgroup or something? Oh no, it's a space. So. Yeah, so this is using uh, sort of an argument that you'd recognize from Martin Brideson's very early work uh -huh. where you, um, Martin cooked up some geometric criteria you can use. Um, since you've got the simplicial complex, it's sort of, um, well, there's a proceed, there's a, Martin, Martin had a procedure you could use to, um, to try something and, and show that it didn't work. So it was, it was modeled on a proof that Martin gave. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry, I, I apologize to the, to Charlie for not giving a very good account of how that proof goes. <laughs> I'll check it out. Modeled, modeled on some, some of Brighton's early work. Um, all right, so uh, Burns Healy. So um, this guy's name is Brendan Burns Healy, but he goes by Burns. He's also, um, he was one of Genevieve Walsh's students at Tufts. Uh, Burns proved that out WN is acylindrically hyperbolic for n greater than or equal to three. And uh, to do, and, and also that if it acts geomet geometrically in a cat zero space X, then X contains a rank one geodesic. And that means that amongst other things out WN cannot act geometrically on the Euclidean building. So this is hot off the press as well. This is um, a preprint that came out in April. Um, so Burns did this using the connection between um, out WN embedding that in the automorphism group of a free group. I guess he embedded it in the outer automorphism group of a free group. Um, so um, you can check out that proof. Um, so this is more information about the question of are these groups out WN, are they cat zero? But it's, it's, we're still not answering the question. We're just um, somehow zeroing in on criteria for what the space is. If there's a cat zero space, here are some properties it must have. And so the question still is still lurking. Um, unanswered, but, but what I like about the question is that people can make progress on certain things like Charlie was able to prove that the candidates, but the best candidate space we had at the time was not going to be the one that you, that you could use to answer the question. And then Burns was able to show um, that these groups, 
if they act on cat zero spaces, they have to do so in certain ways. So we're getting we're getting closer, but the the question's still lurking. Um, so here's a different sort of question. If you decide, well, maybe cat zero's uh, too hard, or maybe maybe it's not cat zero, but um, and I keep and sort of I'll, I'm looking for the wrong things. Uh, so maybe we could try a different question, which is what can we say about the isoparametric inequality satisfied by the groups? So we know we can make statements about the iso. So in case you, you haven't encountered it, an isoparametric inequality, um, to say that a, yeah, to say that a group satisfies an isoparametric inequality, say something about how many relators you need to use to, to witness that a word that spells the trivial element is in fact trivial. So you, it's related, it looks like it's related to the presentation you use, but up, up to sort of, essentially there's a way in which this is independent of the presentation you use. So we can classify groups into those for which the, those which satisfy linear isopetric parametric inequality, and they are exactly the hyperbolic groups. And then um, lots of other classes of groups like cat zero groups and automatic groups satisfy quadratic isoparametric inequality. So if I'm thinking that the automorphism group of WN might be tractable in the sense that maybe I can use some of the techniques like showing it's automatic or cat zero to learn things about the group, so quite a few of these properties imply that the group satisfies a quadratic isoparametric inequality. And of course, when you play around with um, generators for the group and the relations that we have in a presentation and, and how many you need to show that a group element is trivial, you don't see, it's not obvious what the um, isoparametric inequality might be, but uh, we could ask, so it's a, it's a question that we'd like to ask. And it's related to the cat zero question because if it does not satisfy quadratic isoparametric inequality, then the groups cannot be cat zero. So um, another question might be, um, are the groups automatic? Because again, they would give you a quadratic isoparametric inequality and they give you lots of um, nice algorithmic properties. Well, we know that the group, we know that the automorphism group W3 is automatic. We know that the outer automorphism group W3 is automatic, but what about large of A's of N? So um, this is something that Murray, Murray alluded to very briefly in the, in the mingling session, that um, there was a, a Mo Gutierrez and Sava Kristic proved a result about uh, the pure symmetric automorphisms of a free group of rank N and they showed that the pure symmetric automorphisms, um, that they exhibited a regular language of normal forms for, um, for the pure symmetric automorphisms of a free group. And they did so by showing that the language is, was in fact Markov. And what that means is that a, a language is Markov if when you, you can decide whether or not a group, a, a word is in the language by looking at subwords of length two. If every subword of length two is legal, then the word is in the language. So it's um, a language you can describe by describing excluded subwords of length two, is another way of putting it. And Mo and uh, Mo Gutierrez and Sava Kristic wrote a paper where they proved that the pure symmetric automorphisms of a free group um, where they exhibited a Markov language of normal forms for that, that group. They were hoping that by finding this Markov language, and Markov language is irregular, they hoped that by finding this Markov language, they could then add to it. Um, they've got a regular language of normal forms. So they're hoping that they'd, they'd demonstrate the fellow traveler property for this language, but they weren't able to do so. It's pretty, it's, um, I, I, it's a pretty hard thing to try to do in this instance. So um, Kim Ruane and I in 2010, um, we sort of ad, inspired by the connection between the pure symmetric automorphisms of free group and um, the automorphisms of WN, we cooked up a, a Markov language of normal forms for 
the automorphism group of Wn and for the outer automorphism group and therefore for the palindromic automorphisms of the free group of n minus one. Um, and, but again, we got stuck. We couldn't show that these languages fellow travel. So we've got a regular language, but the fellow traveling property eluded us. But that's, that was an attempt to answer the question, are these groups automatic? So um, I think I've got uh, just two more results I wanted to mention quickly, but I, I don't want to take the time to say too much about them because they're also fairly hot off the press. Um, and I'm not sure what I could say about them, but you couldn't get by a quick look at the paper. But the following are special cases are more general results. So DASP has a preprint that proves that the outer automorphism group of WN is thick. What does that mean? That's a statement. It, it's thick in the sense of uh, Chris Ruska, Cornelia Drutu, and Jason Bearstock. Oh, sorry, Bearstock, Drutu, and Moshe, uh, my mistake, uh, have this notion of what it means for a group to be thick. And out WN is thick. And therefore, it's not relatively hyperbolic for n greater than or equal to 4. So now we know that these groups are not relatively hyperbolic. And by um, this result of Healy, we know that um, it's, uh, they are acylindrically hyperbolic. Um, so we're starting to get some information about these groups in that way. And then um, Lyman has a preprint out from 2019 that tells us about mapping tori of polynomially growing elements in the groups. So we're starting to see results that if you've, uh, for those who've thought about automorphism groups of free groups, we're starting to see results that um, have the flavor of some of those results as well. And the reason, I just want to point out again, the Darcy and Lyman have results which are not just about the automorphism group of the universal Coxer group, but they're about automorphism groups of free products of finite groups. So it's a it's much more general case than that. All right, well, um, let's, I'll, I'll leave it at that and take any questions if people have them. Any questions for Adam? Um, I have a question, Mari. Yep. I can turn on my... Yeah, so the presentation, can you just write down a presentation and come up with a presentation too complex and thicken it up and maybe use some software to guess a cat zero structure? Um, I, well, the, the answer is you might be able to, Murray. Uh, <laughs> what I does the presentation that's some, look like? That's, that's something you did a bit of in your Tufts days, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I had to think about, about that, but um, couldn't, I didn't try it with software. Um, I didn't think, so it I think that's how Tom Brady's B, B4 result. It wasn't with software, but it's a three dimensional shapes or something that he uses for that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So he used um, three dimensional space for B4, and then when you want B4 modulo at center, you end up with two D space. A sort of a projection thing, yeah. Well, Mario, it, it could be a useful thing to try. I engaged with I engaged with that a, a once once upon a time, but lost hope. But that that's that's not to say it wouldn't it wouldn't work. Yeah. All right. Do we have any other questions for Adam? Well, if not, let's all thank Adam for his excellent talk. Thanks for listening. Yeah, it was a really nice talk, Adam. Thanks. I see that Murray understands his Zoom etiquette. He's, given, he's, he's used a clap and a thumb.